Welcome to Footnote and the ANT Bookstore in Clifton, New Jersey. I'm your host, Kimberly Austin. Ibrahim Abdul Mateen talks to us about his book, Green Dean What Islam Teaches About Protecting the Planet. Ibrahim believes that all Muslims can strengthen their spirituality, become more active in their communities, and live better lives by living a Green Dean. Welcome, Ibrahim. Nice to be here. I really enjoyed your book. Um, but before we talk about the book, I'd love to talk a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? So I grew up part of my life in Brooklyn, New York, some, some part of my life in Queens, but a major part of my life was also in upstate New York. I, I sort of got my first taste of, of the natural world, grass, green trees, you know, the, the, the beautiful surroundings that accompany someone in a rural area. And I had a good balance. I had upstate and downstate. So I understood the only place I never lived was a suburb. Okay. So I got to really absorb the lessons from the city and the, of the people, the, the taste of cultures, the, the sounds, the smells, and of the urban, uh, and of the rural areas as well. But now I'll let you tell us about the book. Tell us, tell us what it's about. So Green Dean, is, uh, Green Dean, what Islam teaches about pr protecting the planet. I, I look at water, waste, energy, and food, and I look at principles in Islam. I look at the, the idea of oneness of Allah, and that, and that all of his creation is also connected. I look at uh, the idea that Everything in nature is a miracle, is, an, is a sign of God's of mercy and grace. And then I look at the idea that we are all the stewards of God on the planet Earth, and with that we have a, a deep covenant, a trust to protect the planet. And then I look at the balance that human beings are part of in this natural creation. We're a part of a, 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 an amazing intricate balance, and we have a responsibility to maintain that balance, and that's doing justice to the planet Earth. So I tell stories about people, I give commentary, and that's, basic, that's the basic structure of Green Dean. And the book is full of wonderful stories, including one about your dad, and he was probably the biggest influence on you as you moved to this direction? It's true. My dad is definitely an outdoorsman. He finds himself the most comfortable in the woods, and he'll regularly go out and pray outside every day. Was that one of the most striking experiences you had then when he would pray? Is that really what stuck with you? Yeah, I think he brought us upstate New York to a place called Bear Mountain. And Bear Mountain is just north of New York. If you were riding your bike, you could make it there within 100 miles. <laughs> I need a light, though. Right? <laughs> and, uh, and, but my dad would bring us there, and I remember one time he brought us there, and we were, he said, it's time to pray. And we were like, pray? You pray in a mosque. You pray in the house. But he was like, no, 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 no. There's a hadith or the saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that says, the earth is a mosque. Everything in the earth is a mosque, and you can pray anywhere if you need to. When you decided to write the book, you know, you've lived this lifestyle, but to actually put pen to paper can sometimes be a little bit intim intimidating. What really sparked your interest in putting it down and writing a book? I think the primary challenge when you're working in the environmental movement is where do what stories need to be highlighted? What connections need to be made so that we can amplify the message? And it seemed as though the, the environmental movement was hyper-secular, that everything was about facts and figures, everything was about framing, and everything was about marketing, and we weren't doing enough framing right, enough marketing right. So we needed to have a, something to connect people's self-interest. Well, a lot of people are people of faith. Christians and Muslims and Jews, Hindus and Buddhists, Jain, people of the Jain faith. And so how can we connect the things that we know scientifically, the things that we know empirically with our, with our faith and the things that, that are a part of our heart? That's such a nice way to look at it because you're absolutely right. It, while your book is slanted toward your faith, anyone of any faith can read your book and, and glean something from it and, and actually go back to those core values that it's, you're talking about. Yeah, it's true. I, I was trying to speak to Muslims uh, and of all stripes and colors, you know, Muslims from all different places and all different levels of practice, but also people that don't know as much about Islam, people that are new and are exploring it, but also folks that are completely of another faith, and hopefully there's something that will reflect their own experience. Now, you touched on it briefly earlier, but what are the six principles of the Green Dean? We speak about Tawheed, which is the oneness of God and His creation. We speak about the ayats or the signs that are also ayats or lines or parts of the, of the Quran, but also ayats or signs in nature. So a tree, a bird, those are signs of, a, of God's grace in nature. Then we speak about the Khalifa, which is the stewards of, 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 of God on earth. And in many ways you can see that as human beings have to pick up where other people came before us and we have to set up the earth in a positive way for the people that are going to come after us. We have to be considerate to the people that come after us. Great point. Then we have a responsibility, uh, this deep covenant, this trust is a, is a deep one between us and God that says we have to protect the planet, that amana. And then the, the idea of balance, we call it mizan, and that balance is that we're in a delicate balance within nature, mm -hmm. and in disturbing the balance is doing injustice. So Islam 
in all faiths, command us to move towards justice, what we call adil in Islam. And so those are the six principles of Green Dean. And as you talk about balance, we'll actually come back and we'll talk more about the balance between the secular and the scientific, and exactly what does the word Dean mean. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're continuing our chat with Ibrahim Abdul Mateen and talking about his book, Green Dean, What Islam Teaches About Protecting the Planet. All right, Ibrahim, what does Green Dean mean exactly? Well, we know what the word green means because we're bombarded by messages of the environment and go green every day. So really green has become the catch-all phrase for anything related to the environmental movement. And if you think back, it used to be pollution that we talked about when we talked about being, or um, acid rain and all these right. things and it, so it's evolved over time. So now we talk about the green movement and that encompasses all of that. Deen, on the other hand, is a term that it's an Arabic word that means the path or the religion or the way. So you can, so anything is a deen. Christianity is a deen. Judaism is, Judaism is a deen. These are different paths or so different ways that you can live your life. Uh, it's similar to the word Dharma. Oh, okay. So then how does the green deen tie together with both the spiritual and the scientific information? I think it's important, as, um, and I'm Muslim, so my context is related to Islam. I think it's important to not disconnect your, your faith with the work that we have to do to protect the planet. Because a lot of what we have to do to protect the planet relies on us having a deep understanding of science mm -hmm. and of doing a deep scientific inquiry. And that re requires us to say, okay, so there's things that we don't know, things that we need to learn about creation. And being a good Muslim in many ways is investigating what God has created and learning more. And science is the tool that we use to learn more about the creation. And along that same path, you say in the book specifically that interfaith work is very crucial to this movement and getting people again to this neutral common ground kind of area. Why is that though? I was in, a, I was in DC, Washington DC recently at the Green Festival and a woman and I were sitting down at lunch and she was an older white woman and uh, we, were, we were having a conversation and I handed her, her a card related to my talk I was about to speak later and then she said well talk to me about Islam and the environment and I went through the principles of Green Dean and one that I spoke, spoke about specifically was the, the idea that human beings are the stewards of the earth what we speak of as the Khalifa and she that resonated for her she spoke about the the opening of Genesis and that human beings have dominion and are to subdue the earth and, and that they're supposed to go forth and be fruitful and multiply. And we talked about our shared understanding of the, of the essence of those teachings that we, instead of dominating and controlling and destroying the earth and pillaging it, we want to leave the earth better than we found it. And that's really, I think, the core of where different faiths can really get together and do some work together. Right. And global warming is, of course, a big topic right now. I won't say a hot topic because that'd just be <laughs> cheesy. But where, where can we find common ground, again, now using our spirituality when, we, when it comes to that discussion so we're not arguing about the science? I think sometimes we get caught up in the fear related to global warming. Okay. So I think that if we, we sort of separate the, the, what we've, the, the consequences or the actions, that, the outcomes from the glo what we call global warming, and those are sea level rise, hotter temperatures, and those come from real human actions. Mm -hmm. We can address human actions. We don't have to label it anything specific. We can change the way that we pump carbon and toxins into the atmosphere, and we can, we can make a dramatic shift. We just have to ag agree that those things are actually making us sick. We don't have to agree at what it's called. Okay. We just have to identify, hey, maybe this is a, there's a, a better way to do things. Right. Oh, that's a great point. You also say in the book that um, this way of life is a political, economic, and this religious imperative. Why is that? I think the essence of Islam and the essence of the, the, the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was that everything in life is interconnected and that we are uh, whole beings. And the way you live in one part of your life has to be reflected in every other part of your life. And that is the primary challenge of being a human being. Do you practice what you preach? So if you, if you think that it's important to leave the planet better than you found it, if you think that, it, that the way we treat the planet is a reflection of the way we treat ourselves, then you would operate 
from that center, from that core in every part of your life, in every aspect of your being. Right. You're not, you can't pick and choose when you want to act out from your faith. <laughs> For sure. Exactly. <laughs> so you have this wonderful way of describing different energy sources in the book that I thought was very clever because not only is it effective in teaching us, but for using it to teach children or the older generation that might be a little more set in their ways at this point. Heaven and hell energy sources, what are they? Energy from hell are, is energy that's non-renewable. It's energy primarily that we take from the ground and we have to destroy things to extract it. And it's also energy that we burn, mm -hmm. right? It's dirty, it's, it's not clean. But also, interestingly enough, it survives off of subsidies, right? It's not really a part of a free market. Energy from heaven, on the, other, on the other hand, is actually energy that is renewable. And that's the key point. It's energy that comes from the sun, from the wind, and there's other sources of renewable energy from geothermal energy. So there's really a way to look at energy in a way that's, do we want to focus on things that we've done in the past that's dirty and destructive, or do we want to find new ways to really harness the best of our abilities on the planet Earth. Absolutely. And when we come back, we'll talk more about renewable sources, as well as more specifically about using the Muslim faith to become more green. We'll be right back after this message. Welcome back. We're continuing to talk with author Ibrahim Abdul Mateen about his book, Green Dean, What Islam Teaches About Protecting the Planet. And let's get a little more specific use, uh, talking about your faith. And I really enjoyed what you talked about in the book with greening of mosques. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I think you walk into a mosque in any part of the country, really in any place in the world, and you're supposed to feel good, right? You're supposed to feel like this is a place for reflection, a place to connect. Um, and I think a lot of times you, you, you might be a little disappointed. And I think, um, and not deeply disappointed, but sometimes maybe the, you know, it's not as clean as it could be, or it's not as warm as it could be, or, you know, those are little small things, but they mean a lot. And I think what I, what I mean really by the greening of mosques is, let's make mosques better, right? We don't have to just have a square space or like, you know, just a general building. We actually can, be, can lead uh, when it comes to creating a real vibrant, thriving, healthy building and a healthy place for, for, for prostration. Which means that when you go into an urban mosque, it's not about asking, you know, for money for electricity, right? It's asking for money to install a new solar panel system. It's asking for money when you, it's not about asking, you know, for money to build a new mosque. Yeah, maybe it's that, but it's also asking for money to do a geothermal energy study before you build the mosque to see if this is the right place to build the mosque. Oh, that's right? a good point. Right. So again, so you place it somewhere where you would have Precisely. access to the sunlight and get the solar panels fully charged like you would need them and to be. And there's invade. different places in the, in, that require different, uh, characteristics that make it a, a green or a healthy mosque. So depending on your climate, your environment, I think you should really make the mosque culturally relevant, just like you make yourself when you walk into a different group of people. And in countries where the Muslim faith is, is more prevalent than in other countries, do you find that they're leading the way as well into, this, into the green living lifestyle? And is the faith what's leading them? Um, I don't, you know, I'll be frank. I don't know if any time in any place is that, that the faith is actually guiding any group of people. I think it's actually the, the recognition that we are in a dire situation mm. ecologically. And the dire situation is, the, the subtle understanding is that we have disconnected ourselves from nature. And so the green movement is a way to, for, for people to reconnect with nature. Um, Sayyid Hussein Nasser, who's the great writer, he wrote Man, Man in Nature, he's one of the great writers of in Islam and the environment, he points this out very, very poignantly. And just this relationship that human beings have to the natural world needs to be repaired. And I don't know if that's, in, in Muslim, Muslim dominant countries, the primary reason why they might be going in certain green directions is mainly because of the economics of it. It makes sense, but that's good as a first step. But one of the groups that you've actually been involved with is, is the Amman group. Correct. Tell us about that. They're the uh, Inner City Muslim Action Network. They start out, there's a, they're a grassroots organization in, in Chicago, the south side of Chicago. It's a mixture of Latinos, African Americans, Arabs. It's a real vibrant American mix. It really reflects the diversity of the American community and the American Muslim community. Mm -hmm. um, as in a side note, the Muslim community in the United States is the most diverse 
a religious group in the United States. Oh. Uh, Iman, one of the projects that I really love about Iman is that they do a re-entry program. So men that are coming out of prison, that want to do right by themselves, that have become Muslim in prison, have a safe space to continue to practice their religion and their faith with fellowship, right? And then they're able to go out and do green re so green retrofitting of homes that have been abandoned. So foreclosed homes that have been abandoned, they're retrofitting those homes and then they eventually live in those homes. That's fantastic. And along those lines, we'll come back and we'll talk more about not only what Iman's working on, but what can we all do to further ourselves and to make the planet a better place than we found it. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're continuing our talk with author Ibrahim Abdul Mateen about his book Green Dean. Ibrahim, what is greenwashing? I noticed that in the book. Greenwashing is when people use the, the framework of being green or being more environmentally friendly just to pull a profit. Okay. So it becomes a marketing ploy instead of a real strategy to protect the planet. And it actually respond, it, res, re, it speaks to the way that we see things, right? You think mm -hmm. that you can just buy things and go green. The, the real question is buy, consumption overall and how do we, what do we choose to use and why, why do we do, is it need versus want? And that's really the challenge. And is that really the basic definition of overconsumption or is, it, is there more to it? The way that I speak, speak about overconsumption in the book is re relates to our, it relates to the environmental movement. So you wouldn't have an environmental movement if you didn't have overconsumption. So now every single person, every single day has to consume resources just to live, just to survive. But you don't have to overconsume. And there's a, there's, a, there's a break that happens when you start to overconsume and you do things based on material need and greed, right? So corporations start to do things because they feel like they have to get ahead. Then they start to create waste and toxicity. They dump that into the air and the land and in the sea. And then what you see right now is a response to that, right? A response to overconsumption. And every single person on the planet can do something about that. So as a person, where, where's the best place to start to try, try to decrease your consumption? You mentioned in the book, home might be the best place to start? Home is definitely the best place to start. What I, I like to tell folks wherever, whenever I'm out speaking is that figure out specifically how much waste do you create in your own family? How much trash do you, do you do you create? Figure that out throughout the course of a week. How many garbage bags do you put out? And then the next week, put out a little bit less. So take real incremental slow steps and start from scratch, really. It's really starting from scratch and that mindfulness of knowing. There's a hadith in, in the, um, of the, a saying of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, where he said, when you make wudu, and I'll talk about water, but when you make wudu, which is the, the ritual ablution before you pray, even if you're by a river, then you should not waste the water. It's not, though, it's not that you would waste water, you're by a river. It's that you're supposed to get into a habit of not wasting. Now, also in the book, though, you talk about some green Muslims that are, um, are very important and um, have great stories to tell. Would you share one with us? There was a, a gentleman named Yasser Saeed, who's in the D.C. area, who has a company called Green Zabiha, and you can go to greenzabiha.com. And, and I tell the story in the book of when I first went out with him to get, um, the first time I went out with him to get a, a Thanksgiving turkey, and we uh, slaughtered 60 turkeys in a very traditional Islamic way, uh, which is a very somber, um, deep practice where you are mindful of the, your role as the steward. You're mindful of that you have this covenant with God. You're mindful of the delicate balance. You're mindful that, you, that these are signs in, in nature, right? You're mindful that you're a part of everything that's in nature in this process. So naturally, you, you don't want to waste this opportunity. So the slaughtering of the animals was, a, was an act of worship. But I really think that's the direction we need to be going in. Grass-fed, hormone-free, organic, um, you know, and, and, and the beauty of the Islamic tradition is that we already have a template for this to happen. The halal Zabiha template is already ready-made for a green world. Just like you'd mentioned before, the covenants really are already yeah. there. We just kind of need to reconnect to them. I think you're right. And I think that a lot of us, you know, we think of this in the environmental movement. It's really what our parents used to call home economics. Right. right? Yeah. It's really what they used to call agricultural science. It's just being mindful of what's in your environment. It's just understanding the science of everything in your environment so you can use it to the best of your ability to protect the planet. And knowing too that this isn't hard to do. Yes, <laughs> that is a challenge. Um, what do you hope people take away from the book? 
The most important thing that I think that people should take away from Green Dean is that the way we treat the planet is a reflection of the way we treat ourselves. Um, Yasser Saeed, who I just mentioned earlier, who has greenzabiha.com, he said this in a talk. He said, what do you feed cat food to? A cat. What do you feed dog food to? A dog. And the question is, what do you feed junk food to? Ah. Human beings. So we don't see ourselves as sacred. We don't see ourselves as part of God's creation. And, that, and, we, and as, because of that, we see it a, a completely separate, so we can do whatever we want to it. We can destroy it. We can dump toxins into it. We need to recognize that we are actually part of that, that the way we treat the planet is a reflection of the way we treat ourselves. I'm so glad you wrote the book. Thank you so much for being here, Ibrahim. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ibrahim. So, how green is your dean? Well, no matter what your faith is, as Ibrahim says in the book, we all live and work here together, and we have a collective responsibility to keep the earth clean and safe for everyone. In fact, the best idea is to leave it better than we found it. Thank you for being with us today. I hope you'll join us again next time on Footnote.